Okay, uh, we're happy to be starting another semester of the hottest seminar. This week's speaker is Urs Schreiber from NYU Abu Dhabi, and his title is Topological Quantum Programming in, or sorry, via homotopy, sorry, via linear homotopy types. Go ahead, Urs. Yes, thank you very much. And thanks very much for the invitation. I appreciate it. Right, so I want to talk about uh, something that relates uh, homotopy type theory to um, the topic of quantum computation. And I understand, and I've also been warned again, that the audience, of course, is not necessarily familiar with uh, anything related to quantum and uh, quantum computation. So I'm actually trying, I will start out with something that is purely homotopy type theoretic, and then motivate and introduce through that the application to quantum um, and quantum computation that we have in mind. So that should work as an introduction and motivation to the quantum topic. In fact, that is somehow the, the interest of this topic that I'm trying to present. I, I wanna make plausible that there is actually a rather tight, interesting connection that seems you know, superficially a priori unlikely between homotopy type theory and specifically topological, but also general quantum computation. And the goal of my talk is to um, give some idea of how that works and uh, highlight a handful of little results we have. But uh, kind of the main message I want to bring across is this uh, this general relation that exists. So we have, I think, three articles now in the archive that are related to this topic. The main one that I'm starting with is the one that you see on the screen, Topological Quantum Gates and Homotopy Type Theory with David Just Myers and Hisham Sati. And, um, that is the one of the three that is genuinely purely homotopy type theoretic that displays the construction in ordinary homotopy type theory and uh, relating that to, to onion braid gates. And if time permits at the end, um, I might say a bit about um, this generalization, this novel generalization of homotopy type theory that exists now, at least on paper, the linear homotopy type version where we can actually uh, natively in the language speak about um, quantum aspects in the sense of linear um, type theory. All right, so that said, I'll, here's, um, here's the kind of slides that I have to present. And um, I'll start, just to put us into context, I'll start with showing a definition from the traditional literature of what is called Gauss-Mannin connections, mainly just to show how verbose and non-systematic it is, <laughs> even though it's a very important definition. And then on the next slide, I want to show a really slick, very simple um, type, just some truncation of some dependent function types of which our first theorem claims it's actually equivalent when you interpret it in the usual way in the homotopy category in you know infinity group words, it's actually equivalent to this traditional notion. And that is the first of the you know maybe interesting equivalences that will um, then in the next step lead us to these quantum gates. So let's first see what it is about these Gauss-Mannin connections. Um, one reference here, which, can I see it shrink this here? One, one reference for this, uh, one textbook reference or monograph is by Claire Vosin on Hodge theory and complex algebraic geometry. And she offers this definition. I'm not asking you to read through it. Uh, I'm just showing you to give an impression of what it is in the, in the standard literature. I think this is a, she gives a good account compared to what is elsewhere. And uh, in just a moment, I'll show you the actual, if you will, definition, that the neat definition and type theory. But just to, to show that this connects to something that people have considered before. So people consider a vibration of manifolds, a, a proper submersion. There's a total space X and a base space B. And if you go through this text, eventually you'll see that there's a, supposed to be a sheaf of abelian groups on this X. And one computes the cohomology of the fibers of this vibration here. So X zero is one of the fibers, typical fiber of that vibration. And we want to compute the cohomology of these fibers. So independency of B and the, the claim. And then the definition is that if this is nice enough, so what's down here assumes a proper submersion. What, what one really needs is that it's a fiber bundle. Then um, it turns out that these cohomology sets, these sets of cohomology groups just um, form form another local system over B. So they form a zero truncated type in our language over B. And since implicit in this text is the assumption that this sheaf of abelian groups, it actually is a sheaf of um, 
you know, vector space, that linear structure, one can then put, we can regard it equivalently under Riemann-Hilbert correspondence or whatever you like as a flat vector bundle with connection, this bundle of cohomology sets, right? So there is the claim that the Gauss, and that's called the Gauss-Mannin connection. So in, in summary, the statement is under nice conditions. If you have a, if you have sort of a parametrized domain, be parametrized, then taking fiber-wise cohomology, in fact, twisted cohomology even, because this is I mean, any locally constant sheaf, forms itself, the cohomology sets themselves form a local system, um, which in this language carries a connection or is a connection, a flat connection called, called the Gauss-Mannin connection. And that plays a fundamental role and in various contexts. So Bozan considers this in a Hodge theory, We'll be interested in the application of this Gaussian connection to another um, kind of connection called the Knishnik Samologikov connection, which is probably even more famous, even though it's a special case. But before we come to this, let me now show you how this works type theoretically. So I'll zoom in here. This is, as you can see, these are not completely ordinary slides. I'm essentially showing diagrams from our article, but I'll zoom in on this. You can ignore the text if you, I mean, I'm asking you to ignore the text. You just zoom in on. I have some nice diagrams, I think, that are as good as slides and we'll show them. So just to recall, before we look at the, the fiber twisted cohomology, just something very basic, we'll be concerned with uh, cohomology, ordinary cohomology for the time being, even though uh, if you look at the titles of our articles, we were actually motivated by doing this, not just in ordinary cohomology, but in K-theory. But in this talk, I'll just entirely be looking at ordinary cohomology. And so the setup is we have some type, a ring type, a set with ring structure, and uh, we pick some natural number n, the degree of our cohomology, and we take, it, take any domain type x, and then it's a standard construction, of course, the degree n cohomology as a plain type in this uh, so far, with coefficients in R on x or of x is just the zero truncation of the function type of maps from x to the n-fold delooping of this meant to be the underlying abelian group of that ring R. So I guess I can assume, maybe can I, that people are familiar with the n fold. So this is the eilenberg maclean type in degree n for this abelian group type. Maybe you can construct it as the first delooping and then n minus one times suspended and uh, n truncated. So that is ordinary cohomology. And we're gonna enhance this a bit. First to twisted cohomology. This is crucially important for the application that we're after. So I assume the same data as before, a ring, natural number, a base type, but now in addition, a twist, and by twist, I shall mean, um, twists can be many things of cohomology, but since our coefficient was already supposed to be a ring type, um, I'm taking the twist to be a map from our base, from our domain X into the delooping of the group of units of R. So R times as usual is meant to be the multiplicative group um, of invertible of non-zero elements in R. And since that group of units canonically by left multiplication of the ring R on itself acts on R, we actually have that R canonically becomes a type dependent on BR times. And I'm gonna here on the right, if, if you allow me to just zoom in on this, on this right piece. On the right, we are, we're looking at, at various terms in the context of B R times. And this notation here is meant to be the incarnation, this arrow for action is meant to be the incarnation of this abelian group underlying the ring type R as a dependent type on R times. So it's it's the type family over B R times, which over the essentially unique point is just underlying abelian group and which over a path given by an element in this group of units it's given by the left multiplication action of that element on R. That's what the notation means. And so given that, we can now form the function type from the homotopy fiber of tau, that was the twist, remember, from, from X to um, BR into, into this n-fold delooping. And then take, if you will, the invariance the R times invariance of this. Or if we rearrange this, you're probably very familiar with this. It's just the same thing as considering maps out of our original type X, but now we're mapping into the pullback of our previous, of this, uh, 
of this uh, you know action object here under our twist map, which remember is a map from X to um, B R times. So um, many of you may be may be happy with this with this formula, but of course in in the usual semantics in um, you know spaces. This interprets as the formula that you may find in, or the diagrams you may find in algebraic topology text. So our first, the first line expressed this uh, maps in the slice over BR times from X to this coefficient object, which we may think of as the universal BN n fold suspended R underlying fiber bundle, which is associated to the universal R times bundle over BR times. This is the homotopy quotient. And then, so we're taking these maps and asking them to be to be maps in the slice. That is, what, that is what this construction here achieves. Or equivalently, this type equivalence up there is the usual observation in algebraic topology. That this, of course, is the same as by the universal property of the pullback, of pulling back this universal higher bundle, universal higher gerb, if you will, pulling it back to x along tau, and then considering a section of that bundle. So this is how you will maybe see twisted cohomology introduced in algebraic topology textbooks as sections of fiber bundles whose fibers are the coefficients that we used to use in the ordinary cohomology, in this case, n fold looping of our underlying. And now, interestingly, what happens now is that in type theory, it's now in homotopy type theory or dependent type theory, it's now a triviality it's just built into the formalism to further make all this to further parameterize all this by yet another base type but um, you know traditionally this was not as obvious and therefore it carries all these names like those mining connections so my claim will be that just making this dependent on another base type b will yield what in the literature is, literature is called these gauss manic connections so i'm considering a further slight enhancement of the data we already had we still keep the ring we still have a degree n we um we, in addition now, introduce a base type B, and we ask that X is no longer just a you know global type, but now actually a B-dependent type family. So X, the subscript is meant to be the name of the fibers of this over the terms B. And crucially, I mean, here's the slight subtlety here is how to generalize the twist. It's important to have the twist be, well, globally defined, but actually type theoretically, it's again, actually the obvious thing, also the twist, is meant to be B-dependent now. So for each term in our base type B, we want a twist as before, but now on the fiber space. XB is the um, right the assignment here to a term B. So, so we have a coherent invariant twist, and we have this base type. And then type theoretically, it's a triviality. I mean, you typically just absorb this actually in your notation, don't even make it explicit. Then we can consider now the B-parameterized family of these twisted cohomology types, twisted cohomology sets, right? So we just leave the dependency on the parameter and be implicit here, or, you know, leave it open. And so in total, then we have the same formula as before, only that now tau depends on this extra parameter B. So the whole thing in the end, the twisted cohomology set, twisted cohomology type is now itself a type family over B, over each, Term in B, it associates the twisted cohomology. Yeah, let's look here. Over each term in B, it associates the twisted cohomology of the fiber XB with coefficients in R, with the twist being the restriction of our twisting map to that fiber. But now since we have a type family, you see it's kind of amazing. Actually, I mean, I don't know, maybe not to you, but it is kind of amazing. <laughs> Still that, um, you know, just by general nonsense now of type theory, since we have this type family, we have the type transport in this family. So we can speak of the transport, which takes paths in our base type B to, well, to what does it send them? It sends them now to um, isomorphisms, to equivalences, but these are just sets between these twisted cohomology sets. So here, if you have a path from B1 to B2 in B, then um, we get um, an equivalence between the B1 twisted cohomology of XB1 to the tau b2 twisted cohomology of xb2. And now it's not meant to be surprising, but it also was in the literature. And so the first thing we prove in this article is that if you take, if you take this construction and now pass to its interpretation in um, you know, 
topological spaces or simplicial sets, then it comes down equivalently to exactly what Voisin, for instance, defined to be the Gauss-Mannin connection in the sense that this um, transport here is the what's called the, the parallel transport, the monodromy operation, if you go in loops of that bundle of cohomology groups. So that is the first little fact I want to mention. And now comes on top of this. So you might say this is maybe, I don't know, this is maybe an, an interesting exercise in synthetic um, algebraic topology. Gauss-Mann connections are nothing but pipe transport in um, families of twisted cohomology types. But now comes a less obvious theorem, um, which provides further interpretation of this construction in a special case where our domain B is uh, a configuration space of points or equivalently the looping of a braid group. And in order to show you how, to, how we construct this B, I'm gonna recall some classical constructions here, which are for the moment not type theoretic, it's just classical, just traditional, but we'll, we'll see in a moment that it's easily imported into type theory. So almost now, uh, almost, um, closing in, into almost uh, 100 years ago, Artin famously introduced uh, the Artin braid groups, the groups um, indexed by a natural number whose elements are to be thought of as isotopic classes of, well, liter literally braids between, or how should I say, um, paths that are traced out by points in the plane. This is meant to be points that have been ordered here, but they're well, they're sitting sort of in a line, but you should think of them as actually living in the plane. That's what the little circles are meant to indicate. And the group element is the isotopic class of these points now moving in time, if you will, along some um, arbitrary parameter here to um, come back to the same kind of configuration of linear configuration um, without ever at any given time, without ever coinciding. And as you can see this in the obvious way, is something that looks like a braid and therefore it's called the braid group. And there are a slight variants of this, as we can see here in the next diagram. Namely, if we, if we demand that these points, as this picture actually shows, only come back to themselves up to permutation. So, you know, point number one goes to point number five here. Then we speak, if we allow this, then one speaks of the plain braid group. Um, if we forget the if we forget the braid associated with such a plain braid, <laughs> then we still have the underlying permutation of that just says one goes to five, two goes to two, three goes to four in this example. And so there's this group homomorphism from the plain braid group here for some reason that is not important. Well, it's sort of important, but I'm, I'm labeling them by, them by n plus one. So there's this group homomorphism extracting the permutation from the plain braid group to the symmetric group extracting that permutation. And the kernel of this, so those braids that actually uh, move all these points back to not just uh, the configuration they had, but actually to the actual order they had, is called the pure braid group. And now a classical fact of lower dimensional topology says that these braid groups, well, first of all, that's the obvious, maybe the intuitively obvious aspect, that these braid groups are equivalently the fundamental groups of certain configuration spaces of points, that's this conf. So let me start maybe on the left. So by conf, unless I said the set one to n plus one in R2 is meant the topological subspace of the n plus first Cartesian product of R2 with itself. So that would be n plus one tuples of points in R2. But then we take the subspace where none of the pairs of points ever coincide. So that we always have a subset in R2 of actually n plus one points not coinciding. That's simply the configuration space. So we take the complement, as one says, of the fat diagonal where um, we remove the loci where just any two pairs in this n plus one tuple coincide. That's exactly what the picture above showed. And similarly, since on these points, they then being ordered, there's still an action of the symmetric group permuting the points. We can quotient out this action and form this configuration space, which, um, in my notation is now simply distinguished by the, the way the suffix here, this, the subscript works, which, which is maybe not optimal. But if I if I don't spell out this set here, I mean, it's the configuration space of n plus one points and I'm not distinguishing them. I'm not bijecting them to a fixed set, that's the idea. And uh, so clearly 
a loop here is exactly a general braid as we had before, which just moves the configuration back to itself, not necessarily preserving its order, whereas here it does preserve the order. So this is kind of obvious. This is maybe the way to actually define the braid group or one way of defining it. There's many ways, um, but, but the um, also classical, but maybe not quite as tautological point is that these configuration spaces are actually classifying spaces for the braid groups. It turns out besides uh, pi zero, if you will, they're connected, um, they have no higher homotopy groups. So the configuration space is actually weakly homotopy equivalent to the corresponding delooping, to the delooping of the corresponding braid group. And hence, if you will, since we're regarding this braid group as a discrete group, it's weakly homotopy equivalent to an einberg mclean space for the pure braid group in degree one. And so, so, in applications to physics that come in the next slide in just five minutes, it's very manifestly these configuration spaces that play a role. These configuration spaces will become literally configurations of certain what's called topological defects in solid in um, in certain materials. But under this weak homotopy equivalence, and since we're just interested in Gauss-Mann and in you know topological structures that is homotopy invariant we'll actually model not to invoke co cohesion or such things, just to stay in plain type theory. We we'll actually model these configuration spaces in a moment as these de-looped rate groups. And uh, in order to do this, I need to I need to convince you that you can get your hand on these de-looped rate groups in type theory. And for that, I'll just briefly show, I'll just claim the, the fact that it's in the literature that these groups are actually finitely presented so they have a finite number of gen. You can construct them by a finite number of generators and a finite number of relations, and as such, can just hard code them, if you will, into um, your computer. There's other ways to get your hands on them again, but um, this generators and relations presentation will actually be important in just a moment in order to define the twist on this space, because we're going to take this space to be the X on which we consider twisted cohomology in just a moment. So already Artin proved 100 years ago that the ordinary break group is, is generated from, from these evident uh, generators where a neighboring pair of strands switches position, subject to, first of all, the obvious rule that the, the vertical shifting of these braids, if they're parallel to each other, does clearly not matter. And then the less trivial Young-Baxter equation uh, type constraint which is this one here, which also, as it goes with these constraints, one can easily convince oneself that this should hold in the braid group if it is constructed the way I described it is. And of course, the theorem is that it's actually sufficient to impose just this relation. So this is Artin's famous presentation um, shown here in this readable algebraic form. But what we're actually gonna use is a similar presentation of the pure braid group, which was um, to my knowledge only um, actually written down much more recently just, if you, just in 2010, I think, at least in this nice form that I'm showing here. So for the pure break group, remember the strands for a given braid need to come back to where they started. And the generators are those, the generators that I may take are those where the ice strand, just one of the strands lassos, if you will, just one of the other strands. And you can write them either this way. So that a general, right, on a composition is just an illustration of how the composition works in the obvious way. You lasso these around, and then the relations are as shown here. It's not super important what they are. Important is there's a finite set of them and they're easily written down. First of all, there's again the obvious relation, which says that the relative vertical position of these braids is irrelevant if they don't lasso each other. And then there's these a set here. Let me zoom out for a moment. There's a set of five. This is this one equation here, is another one, is another one, here's another one, which um Lee, I think, found in 2010 are sufficient. Let me just let me just show one of them in large here. You can see um, again the fact that such a relation should hold is obvious intuitively, at least given the definition. Just sliding one of the braids through the, I mean, below the other one, if you if you like. What is important though is to notice that these are always commutator relations. All of them say that um, composing one generator with the other is the same as composing them the other way around. Like this one says the same here. This has the important consequence that it's easy to define group homomorphisms out of the pure braid group into an abelian group. In an abelian group, all these group all group commutators vanish trivially. And so 
one consequence of this presentation, this final presentation by Lee here um, of the pure break group is that in order to specify a group homomorphism, we just have to define group elements uh, for each generator. Okay, so that's configuration space and break groups. And now comes the less obvious claim here. Well, first of all, we can make a construction before we claim anything. Um, the computer is coming slow here. Let's see how this works. So I'm gonna, what I'm showing here is now just the specification of the previous Gauss-Mannin connection in type theory, um, which remember was this, this parameterized version of a bunch of twisted cohomology groups where the only specification now is that I choose this base space um, in the fiber, well, I choose, <laughs> yeah, I make choices. I should not say just, so we take the, um, the vibration, I should say here. So we take X and B both to be break groups. So this is our, this was our X before, and this is the base space B. So X is just the delooping of the pure break group on, on a number capital N plus lower N generators. And down here, we forget these, um, sorry, I should say strands. We forget the lowercase N of these strands. If you remember that these were homotopy equivalent to configuration spaces of points, then this is simply the, the evident vibration of configuration spaces of points, where here you have capital plus lowercase n of points, and you just forget the lowercase n ones. And in terms of these generators, this just means that if a generator lassoed, so this is meant to be the generator in the deloop group, so it's a path in the delooping, right? So if it lassoes one of the lowercase guys, which get discarded, then it just becomes the identity, and otherwise it's kept. And since, as I just said, we have this presentation, all the relations were group commutator relations, we can define a twist, a global twist in the, on, on this total space. Remember, this was our X. So this just drops from the sky for a second. You just have to accept this. I, I can just do this. And I'll show you in the next slide the rather remarkable consequence that this particular choice of twist has. So this is just something that is it's out of the blue for the moment. The point is just, we can easily define it, namely, um, we want to we want to twist by so our r or ring r is now the complex numbers, the Cauchy complex numbers, if you will, so equipped with their uh, discrete topology, just the the plain ring, and um, we we assign so this is since the group of units of C, which in particular includes the the unit circle. So we want to assign roots of unity to these um, generators, and we do it this way: we choose weights, what they called weights. So they're just um, elements of the set um, of elements from zero to kappa minus two, where kappa is um, an extra parameter that I should have maybe mentioned before, that is at least two. So these are these are small natural numbers, and the phases we assign here are these. If you if you allow myself to assume that we have enough arithmetic in our type theory to to speak about the standard constructions here in the complex numbers, or else you assume kappa to be small, and uh, then we're looking at you know roots of unities of small degrees which have simple uh, other formulas. For instance, if if kappa is four, then then these are simply um, you know plus minus one or plus minus imaginary unit stuff like this. Anyway, we take take this exponential weight over kappa. If we braid, if we braid one of the lowercase points around one of the uppercase ones, we assign this phase two over kappa, or you know the exponential phase two over kappa. If two of the lowercase points um, move around each other, and we assign this phase if two of the uppercase um, strands move around each other. So that certainly defines by our generators and presentations relations this group homomorphism. And so we just enter with this and construct our gauss manning connection on these fibered delooped braid groups, which is this construction here, right? So I'll just recall again, this maybe a little unwieldy term here just says that in each, if, if you fix, if you fix a bunch of uppercase strands, then you left with the configuration space here and the fiber of this vibration, which is the configuration space of N plus n points with the lowercase n points may move. The uppercase ones are fixed since we're in some fiber. On that configuration space where capital N points are fixed, and on the great braid group, the corresponding braid group, we consider twisted cocycles with coefficients 
um, twisted by this twisting function that I just defined. And then we just take um, the C times invariance to make that actual um, twisted fiber specific homology groups. And now our main theorem, the, the end result of this article that I showed at the beginning is that if you now interpret that specialization of the Gauss-Mannin connection, oh, by the way, I should maybe show, here's, here's kind of the, the picture I just described in words. So we're essentially mapping out of these configuration spaces into these coefficients for twisted cohomology fibered over the configuration space of these capital endpoints and sum everything up. So this dictionary shows you how to move between the type I showed and this interpretation and ordinary algebraic topology. And as you can see here, the point is that this is now very particular, turns out to interpret as a very particular Gauss-Mannin connection, which is famous in, and this is now a surprise maybe, in quantum field theory as the knishnek of connection on SU2 conformal blocks on the Riemann sphere. So there's lots of adjectives that go with this. So suddenly with this rather simplistic construction, we entered right into page 500 of a textbook on conformal quantum field theory, where these things are, are discussed as an advanced topic in the field. Many students of the subject in quantum, conformal field theory do not get to this point. And yet we have suddenly such a construction here right at our fingertips in a few lines of would be code. And the way what makes this work is a theorem from by Feigen, Schechtmann, and Varshenko from 1994. So there was a big activity on this kind of topic in the beginning 90s. I think lots of people had this kind of idea then, several people at least. And um, the eventually it was Feigen, Schechtmann, and Varshenko who nailed down the version of that statement that I'm showing here. So this is just a black box theorem now. I'm not explaining this. This takes a lot of explaining, it's a very technical, fiddly thing, but uh, it's just a fact. Um, they computed, so here's, unfortunately, since this is from a slightly different article, this is slightly different notation. So let me just, uh, just highlight it on the right here. This is just our fiber-wise twisted cohomology group that we just constructed. So you see this configuration space, which on the previous slide was a dilute break group. And we here have a fiber-wise twisted cohomology of that dilute break group with a bunch of uh, decorations here in order to make things work. This omega one was what used to be tau because in these in actual computations, people now go and say, oh, by the Durham theorem or the Bohr theorem, this case on a Stein domain, since the conversion space are Stein, we can reformulate this twisted ordinary cohomology in terms of twisted Durham cohomology. So that's what they do. So this is the, any case, the twisted cohomology, which we just constructed. And the amazing theorem of, Feigen, Schechter, and Afashenko is that these cohomology groups for suitably chosen um, decorations here, which involves in particular these very particular twists that I showed, is what in conformal field theory is the, called the space of conformal blocks of um, the Riemann sphere with several insertions which correspond to these points. So what does that mean? Well, um, more recently, so originally this, this was considered in plain conformal field theory at a time when everybody thought about conformal um, field theory as describing the Welch theory of strings. But more recently, and this brings us now to, to the topic of qu quantum computation, more recently people argued, this is slightly hypothetical because an actual experimental realization of this in the laboratory, even though it's expected and has actually also already been claimed, is um, not quite settled yet at least. But people imagine that there is, so now comes the now comes two minutes of, of physics jargon, but the point is that this twisted cohomology that we just constructed actually knows about this physics, which is kind of remarkable. So please bear with me. So the statement is as follows. One imagines that it should be possible to create effectively two-dimensional crystal, uh, crystalline materials, such as graphene. So one thinks of some atoms that are arranged in a, in a monolayer, as they say, or at least in a, in a small multilayer. So essentially two-dimensional, spread out two-dimensionally, arranged in a crystalline fashion. This is meant to be indicated by this uh, gray rectangle here with some defects of certain sort. So that's a long discussion what exactly these defects are, but you can maybe intuitively imagine that in some crystal, there's certainly room for things to, um, at some points, not be quite symmetric. In any case, one imagines that it's possible to form quantum materials, such crystalline solid states, such that 
when defect points are inserted in the actual laboratory, such that the um, that the ground state, as people say, of this material is in a quantum state, as one says, which is a certain abelian group, which is actually, and this is the interesting thing now, which is actually um, to be identified um, with um, with one of these twisted cohomology groups. So, so the statement is, sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite say this right. The statement is that these uh, conformal blocks and hence these twisted cohomology groups are identifiable with Hilbert spaces with vector spaces of quantum states of what's called Lachlan wave functions that somehow describe whatever it is that happens in such topologically ordered crystalline materials. And the point now is that one imagines or one argues, solid state physicists argue that once this has been arranged in a suitable material, the operation of slowly moving these defect points around by some extra external parameters, by maybe changing external um, strain on our material here, that these points move and that under the actual physical operation of moving these points around in the plane, so that you know in temporal form, it looks like a, a world line as shown here, as they come back to themselves, that the quantum state, the element for us in a twisted cohomology group that the system was in here is no longer the same than it was here, but it's transformed by some linear map unitary operator. So we start with some quantum state on the left, some element in this twisted cohomology. We braid these points around each other. We end up with a different element in our twisted cohomology. The physicists would have a different quantum state of the system. And the operation that is part of this remarkable theorem of fagin schechtman Vashenko. The, the unitary operator, the quantum transformation of these states is nothing but this Gauss-Mannon connection on this twisted cohomology group. Once you identify all of this quantum blah, blah, with this type that we constructed. So that is a remarkable result. It, it says that a good bit of traditional conformal field theory has actually purely algebra topological, a purely cohomological incarnation purely cohomological. And so um, by that isomorphism, one now has, in this sense, access in homotopy type theory, if you will, once you construct these braid group types, to an exact specification of these braid operations. So why is this important? Well, because the idea is that we can do quantum computation on these. So now I step back and do some general idea of what quantum computation is about based on this inside we just gained, if you will, from homotopy type theory. So it turns out um, what we just saw is a special case of a very general principle in uh, quantum mechanics. And I'll, I'll introduce it hereby. One of the crown jewels in sort of crown jewel theorems in actual mathematical um, quantum mechanics, which is the quantum adiabatic theorem. And it is the following statement, which is quite remarkable to, I hope it is, uh, to an audience of homotopy type theorists, because it says the following. It says, suppose we consider a quantum system. So of course, I haven't said what a quantum system is. I'm assuming you, so some microscopic system, which has somehow characterized by this linear space, a linear type, if you will, a Hilbert space H, but such that it depends on external classical parameter parameters. So such that if we choose certain external parameters, this could, for instance, as I said, be the strain on our on our mono layer of atoms. It could also be temperature, or maybe we punch the material, or um, we have some other means. This is a long discussion, actually, how to do this. Uh, some other means of moving these defect points. So the position of the defect points would be part of these parameters. In any case, one if one can consider situations where this quantum system is actually parametrized by classical data. And uh, furthermore, well, not furthermore, the quantum adiabatic theorem now says remarkably that as we, if only we move these parameters slowly enough, so this quantum system will have a certain energy scale associated with it, it comes with some Hamiltonian, which I haven't described. So in some naive sense, you can think of it as oscillating at some frequency, doing its quantum thing. And the, the quantum adiabatic theorem is a, is a theorem, an asymptotic statement about limits. It says, that uh, as the movement of these parameters is slow, 
with respect to this eigenfrequency of the quantum system, we can, um, you know, if we can make it arbitrarily slow, then we can uh, ensure to arbitrary accuracy that our quantum transport is what's called adiabatic. That's just jargon for the fact that then the system will remain in its energy eigenstate. So its energy will not change. It will just transform its quantum state by unitary operator de de defined somehow by the dependency of that quantum system on these parameters as we move along. So in the, in the previous case, this feigenstein vashenko theorem and, uh, and these Lachlan ground states, we saw that this um, unitary operator arose that was actually the Gaussmann and monodromy of these twisted cohomology groups in general, it can be something else, but it always is, as this diagram uh, tries to show, it always comes down in this adiabatic limit as being exactly what um, in type three is known as type transport. We have a dependent type, these H's, as, it's, as I'm trying to indicate here, dependent on some base type. And uh, as the paths move, as, as we move along paths, the, the fibers, uh, moved by isomorphisms by equivalences along. Now in this diagram, I'm already writing here, since this was taken from a discussion where we already assumed this, I'm already writing lin type, assuming we already have a notion of linear types, which I haven't really talked about yet. Um, in general, this would be just types so far, just as we had considered um, so far, these twisted cohomology sets without uh, recording their linear structure. Um, but in any case, the picture remains the same that, um, classically parametrized quantum system are slow enough and that in practice that means not very slow because these quantum systems oscillated at high frequency. Um, there is unitary quantum evolution, linear quantum evolution induced by a kind of type transport um, by parameter evolution. And now I already said um, type transport, but of course this is jumping ahead a bit. So at this point, there's no guarantee that um, this is homotopy invariant in any sense. So here's a simple example of where people use this, but let me now skip to the point of what brings us to topological quantum computation, right? So the idea was now, this is called holonomic quantum computation. The idea was to make use of this dependence of quantum states on slowly varying classical parameters to do a kind of computation. The idea is, well, maybe this quantum system does something fancy as we move a boring parameter. So we can maybe easily describe this parameter moving, but the quantum system actually does something that is interesting and that we can regard as being a computation, a quantum gate, something whose result we may not readily maybe pre-compute, but which maybe after we've actually performed this deformation in the laboratory, we could just measure the quantum system after the transport to figure out what it did. And then we had the result of some kind of computation that did it. But the subtlety with all this quantum business is that it's very delicate, it's very sensitive to noise. It all these powerful aspects, all this new extra fancy structure in the quantum system is on a constant peril from being destroyed by, by decoherence, as one says in the technical term, by interaction with the environment. So it's it's actually hard to engineer in the laboratory systems where um, the desired transport of that you that you get for a given path isn't washed out by uncontrolled extra interaction that the system has besides besides your um, actual intended transport in particular you you may want to move these points by you know using some 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 ways of interacting with your system but you as maybe this weekly lines may indicate you may have a hard time in the actual laboratory to moving them along an actual definite path there may be noise in the path so that you cannot be quite sure along which exact path you actually transport it. And this will um, can lead to this decoherence effect. And now the big idea of um, Kitaev originally, now 25 years back was that, well, unless of course, we can arrange that the system is, well, first to say topological, they mean homotopical. They mean it's invariant under small deformations. So what if actual, actually the, um, the dependence here um, on, well, actually I could show this on the left already. What if the dependence is only the, on the homotopy class of these paths? And that is of course, that's why I'm just uh, kind of, I've just assumed it in this in this slide. That is of course what we automatically guess if we already know that our quantum states are given by this Knishnik -Knish homologic of connection because we constructed that as a zero truncated type family. So it's automatically being by the zero truncation homotopy invariant. But then the next thing is, well, okay, so then, then 
nothing now seems to depend on these paths anymore. Well, except of course, if there's interesting fundamental interesting fundamental group structure in the base, then paths are now distinguished only by, so they can wiggle as much as they want. They can have as much noise as they want, but as long as the noise is small and continuous so that it doesn't disrupt the system and move it from one connected component of this path space here to another one, um, by the homotopy invariance, the quantum computation will be stable. That's the idea. Everything will just depend on the homotopy path and we get these transformations, these quantum gates, depending just on these paths that are now actual paths in the sense of homotopy type theory. Homotopy classes of, not quite homotopy class, but paths that are well-defined up to homotopy equivalents. So, and now just to come back to, so that was the general idea of topological quantum computation. And then when people 25 years back had that idea that this is what one should do, then the question was, well, okay, so how do we find parameter spaces that have rich enough fundamental group and uh, possible depends on that of these quantum states that by moving around these paths and what is now the fundamental group, we can actually get interesting um, operations on these linear maps. And um, yeah, the, the now famous, now almost always regarded as synonymous with the general idea of topological quantum computation is this, this idea of, of braiding, of, of considering um, these defect points that braid around each other uh, being the parameters. Okay, so that is that is this idea of topological quantum computation as making use, if I may recapitulate, making use of interesting dependence of, rather remarkably, twisted cohomology groups on a parameter that says how the domain changes. And so um, that brings us now to this broader topic of type theory and and quantum computing. So now maybe I can't do what I wanted to do here. Let's see, I wanted to show this full screen. Just a moment. Oh yeah, that works, okay. So here's some actual slides now. So this is a bit of an advertisement. So that what, I, what I'm showing now is not a technical statement, but I think it's really important to be aware of this if you're not, I mean, some of you may know this, um, but it's really important to know because there's a huge amount of attention um, regarding the issues that I'm uh, showing now currently in the in the, quantum computation um, community. And what I'm claiming here, or what I'm what I'm showing in these slides now is that um, dependent type theory has the answers to this. So namely the point is the following. The, despite all the buzz that you may or may not have heard about, it's a well-kept public secret that for real, meaning um, realistic, meaning serious, not toy quantum computation, one needs, one needs a bunch of, um, um, a bunch of conditions need to be satisfied for that to actually work, which are currently actually in, in practice, not yet really satisfied. So there's research to be done here, and there's something that I think type theory can do. And type theory is currently doing. I mean, people are already applying dependent types, of course, to quantum computation. The issue is the following. The issue is stabilization of the quantum system. That is this, this issue that is, the quantum system is very uh, fiddly, uh, uh, what's the word? <laughs> is very uh, sensitive to, um, to to little noise. So it needs to be stabilized. Um, then compilation um, means that we need to be able, it's hard actually to, right, I said, I said there can be interesting computational content in these adiabatic involutions, but it's actually not so trivial to encode exactly what you want to encode in, in your system. So there's an issue here and maybe as a result of the first two, the issue of verification becomes more pronounced than it was before. Or at least that is what the community argues. I show you the, the quotes now, but I'll, I think it should be brief, maybe because I'm closing in on the end here. But just, just very briefly, these are three desiderata. We need to stabilize the system. We need to be able to actually compile to it. And we need to be sure that the end result is what we really thought it was. And I'm showing now arguments that have been made before prominently. So these are not my claims. So the, the idea of this topological quantum computation is that it achieves this stabilization. It may not be the only such thing, but some authors, as I'm citing here, um, have claimed this. So this is a standard intro that you may find in quantum topological uh, text where people say the standard architectures is not well enough. We need topological protection, but then there's more prominent people like Dasarma here not so long ago, who made the point that actually, no, it's 
uh, let's be honest, what currently exists in the laboratory is not going to achieve what we want. But what we do need is this topological stabilization. Then compilation, this is an idea that many of you may be, may be familiar with um, since it connects to category theoretic, what's called category theoretic quantum mechanics. It's now, by now, an, an old idea um, promoted very much by Samson Abramsky and Bob Cookie, as I'm setting down here, I think, um, who observed that much of this linear structure in quantum uh, mechanics um, is only transparently resolved when you actually talk about linear types, which in category theory means you regard the operations on these um, quantum systems as being morphisms in non-Cartesian, or in, in particular, it means that it means more in non-Cartesian symmetric model categories. And here I'm showing this, uh, maybe a nice quote from one of these early articles where people noticed that a, a thing called quantum teleportation, which, which the founding fathers could have could have written down because it's easy to write down, took 60 years to realize. And the, the claim is here, by book here, but it's a plausible claim that the reason it took so long is because you need to think really in terms of linear category theory, meaning symmetric monoidal category theory or linear types in order to make it evident. So this is an argument that some linear kind of circuit logic is necessary. And then comes a very interesting argument that says that even if we have this linear circuit log logic, the it's actually hard, you know, these topological gate sets are very constrained. You can't easily implement any gate you want. You have to compile now these braids in a very clever way. And um, and and the idea is that this more this this um, this way of you know quantum compilation of encoding your intended computation on this quantum system by doing some fancy things with your classic parameters becomes now so far remote from human intuition that you cannot. Um, have the usual excuse to say, oh, we will we will just uh, debug this system. In particular, since, you know, on the fly, after, you know, on the run, instead of just verifying it. In particular, since it's not easily possible to debug quantum systems, since every every readout of its parameters actually destroys the computation by, by um, collapse of the quantum state. So there was this nice argument made by Robert Rand. I think he made it first in his thesis, very pronouncedly, he argued that quantum programs demand machine checkable proofs of correctness. Um, the programs are so complex, the expense of running programs is so high, and the traditional debugging doesn't work. And so he states in bold the thesis statement is that quantum programming is not only amenable to formal verification, it demands it, quite in contrast maybe to the um, classical case. And this brings me now to what or well, it's not the last slide that I have, but maybe the last I'll show in, in time here. So we need now to think about some type theory that does all these things. Remember we had, one, oh, sorry, maybe I should actually, I, I should show you the fun thing here. So let me just do it. I, I forgot the punchline. So we had all these, we had all these Zerata topological linear um, <clears throat> typed. And so in total, this means, sorry, I should have not switched back. That was a bit mistake. So in summary, remember the idea was that it's actually needed. So we need a type theory that is topological, which is really just physics physics jargon for homotopical, as we've seen. It needs to be linear. It needs to be typed. So we need some linear homotopy type theory. If you just take the the standard lore of what is needed for serious quantum computation, and that of course uh, does not um, or has not existed. So. So it makes a case for an extension of linear type theory. And this, this is maybe how I, why I'm involved in this. This brings me back, and that's maybe the last thing I'll show here. Um, this brings me back to, to an idea I promoted 10 years ago, where um, just motivated at that time, not from it, this not motivated by um, computation, but just by quantum physics itself, um, what I call quantization by linear multiple types, namely, the idea that what homotopy type theory does for us already in contexts where general infinity toposes do for us the classical math <clears throat> should be refined to the case where these infinity toposes are actually um, toposes of parameterized spectra. So toposes of, that involve linearity. So this is based on the observation, which is actually originally due to Georg Biedermann. This is an old, very old slide, 10 year old slide from here where I didn't say this correctly. I didn't know, I guess. So Jörg was the first to write it up in his notes on Logoi, um, but it was communicated to him by Georg Biedermann. The rather surprising uh, observation, if you first think about it at least, that if you take an infinity topos and consider the collection of all 
parametrized spectrum objects in it. So all spectrum objects, the spectrum objects in all slices and take the, the infinity growth in the construction of these fiber-wise stabilizations. Then that growth in the construction, the infinity growth in the construction is again an infinity topos, even though it involves all these parametrized spectra where you might say, hmm, okay, this, this looks like it's halfway a stable infinity category and hence far from being an infinity topos. But since it's actually fiber, it actually is an infinity topos. And um, yeah, when I mentioned this back, back then, some people, I don't know, maybe anyone in the audience remembers this 10 years ago in Paris, um, there was a big commotion when I stated this, this fact, but it's a fact. And then, um, then I observed, this is, this is from my differential cohomology and cohesive topos. It's not a very um, illuminating diagram at the moment. I just want to show that, um, and the idea was to observe that this is important if we want to talk uh, type theory here. Yeah? The point is now that the tangent infinity topos, so of a given topos, so the infinity topos are enriched with sort of all its linear types that it um, that comes with it. It's actually sitting over H um, by an ambidextrous adjunction. So there's the evident inclusion here by zero sections, and it has both a left and a right adjoint, which back then I called infinitesimal cohesion because it means this is a cohesive structure. Where, where both the where all points are, where uh, components are points. So, and and that's the so so the idea would be that some type theory that axiomatizes some type theory of linear multiple types that knows that we're not just in an infinity topos, but um, actually in one of these infinity topos of parametrized spectra would be a good context to talk about applications to quantum computation where we cannot just um, where we cannot just formalize these quantum gates here by braiding, but actually axiomatize also that they're actually linear. So we can we can make the system verify that everything does behave like a quantum system should behave. And I'll end on the note that for, for a long time, for nine years, such a type theory did not exist. And I think some people uh, turned their heads at my preprint saying, I'm just describing um, semantics for something that doesn't have a syntax. But uh, then um, two years ago, Mitchell Riley in his thesis actually constructs or writes down a type theory, a linear multiple type theory that looks just like it wants to be this kind of enhancement. So it's a conservative enhancement of homotopy type theory, which does know about these linear types and about the tensor products. And it does implement this infinitesimal cohesion by a naturality adjunction. And it does allow us or will, would, once it's implemented, it exists on paper currently to to take this construction of to have a slide for this to take this construction of in particular for instance of the of the um these braid gates and um and and verify um not just uh, certify not just um, you know the output of the braid gate but also its its quantum aspects and so i had more slides here on how the such a type theory such a dependent linear type theory now, rather remarkably, actually knows about just by itself all the intricacies of quantum measurement process, the intricacies that have concerned philosophers for decades, are rather well represented in in any dependent linear type theory that that satisfies some basic conditions as as the one does that I mentioned. Okay, but I'm out of time. I'll stop here. I can say more about this if there's questions. Thanks for your attention. Great, thanks very much, Urs. So we uh, will do our traditional silent applause, or you can use the, uh, I forget the name of the button, the one where you can make little clapping hands appear. Um, great, so yeah, I'll open the floor to questions. Please uh, just feel free to unmute your mic if you have a question. Uh, well, I'll ask one question. So at the end, you were talking about uh, Mitchell Raleigh's work with Dan Licata on uh, on the linear dependent type theory. Um, yes. Do you, I don't know the current status. Like, do you know if there's any implementation in progress or, or anything like that? Sorry, any implementation? Yeah. No, it's not. Um, I No, not currently. I was uh, trying to gently suggest something in this direction. But what is currently in progress is um, 
a rewrite of the type theory on paper to something more economical. So it's just theoretical work currently. And um, right. what what yeah what does exist? Uh, I see now more people of the audience that I didn't see before. What does exist? So Mitchell has written a, a little note where he starts to show how to compile Quipper into his or Licata Finster uh, Riley's type theory. So Quipper um, is one of the existing or maybe the existing um, quantum programming language that is has the ambition to. Um, it has dependent linear types of the way that um, Mitchell's theory does too. It does not have identity types, right? So it's not a homotopy type theory, but it does have dependent linear types and it's used for serious, um, like theoretical, but serious um, quantum programming. And Mitchell has kind of demonstrated on paper again, in, in principle, how one can go and uh, take any given Kuiper program, translate it to LHOT, to linear homotopy type theory, where then it would be uh, verifiable and, and and would have also the potential to, to know about topological quantum gates and lots of other um, boni maybe. So this is, if I may, maybe, maybe I can show this. This is on a web page. This is quantum certification here. So if you go there, if you go there, you find more. So here's so this is kind of a, the this is like the page where the whole project is being subsumed. Quantum certification by linear multiple types. Here's the the articles that I almost presented. This is the one we had, and then I think here, hopefully, this is a little note we made jointly. Yeah, here's the one you want to maybe check out, where Mitchell um, describes how to take a real world to quantum programming language and, uh, and rewrite it in linear homotopy type theory. Um, it's a short note. I think um, you know there's a huge room here for people to join in and, and do something. I think there's quite fascinating material right at our fingertips here, at, the, at least of the, at the fingertips of you know, type theorists, ambitious young type theorists to do um, stuff that I think has a huge chance of being having quite an impact on people who you know come from come from quite different areas, even from industry, and are just interested in making quantum computation work. They don't care a priori about homotopy theory and not a priori about typed languages. But uh, I think there's something that can be done here for them that will make can make quite an impact in the future. It's currently just just an idea, but I think it's a very plausible idea. More questions? Okay, I'll ask another one. Um, so topological quantum computing is, is just one of the ways people are trying to implement quantum computers. Um, and we don't know which way will turn out to be the best in the future. If, if it turns out that uh, we end up using a different kind of quantum computer. Do you think there's still applications of, of type theory in, in that kind of setting? Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, yeah, this is maybe, this is maybe what the second part was about. Um, so independently of the, um, it would have been about, independent of the topological homotopy theoretic aspect, there's a quite um, an amazing input actually that dependent linear types which is a bit of a subtle notion actually, classically dependent or intuitionistically, if you will, dependent linear types, they happen to just intrinsically know a whole lot about the process of quantum measurement. Let me maybe, if I, if I may, just briefly, briefly indicate how this will work, how this works. So, so the, the issue is, the point is that whenever classically we have a, a vibration of context or whatever you want to call this, uh, you know, I'm kind of a semantic person. I have a map of base types here. Then in, in classical dependent type theory, you, you of course get the uh, corresponding a joint triple of base change. Base context extension dependent sum, which I don't write as a sum because now we have also a linear sum and dependent product. And the point now is that uh, we can, if we now have a linear type theory, like as in Mitchell's thesis, this is section two, four in his thesis, um, we we get for such a um, 
uh, extension of context, a corresponding a joint triple of um, linear type formation operations, where in um, the evident um, semantics where we think of these linear types as being like vector spaces or in the model big context they will be chain complexes or module spectra but in any case behave like vector spaces it now we now have a the dependent product and um the dependent sum look like a a direct sum so here i'm assuming that uh, the w is finite it's a finite type over gamma then there's ambidexterity which which actually does follow also in, in Mitchell's type theory, which has to do with the, the, the fact that we're actually talking about stable infinity categories fiber-wise, which makes this left adjoint coincide with this right adjoint. And this means that in the type theory, without adding further structure, we can now actually extract a bunch of modalities just by going um, back and forth along these adjoints. We get actually four, <laughs> sorry, four modalities on quantum types. By quantum types, I mean linear types. So these are types that are only linear parameterized by this corresponding base type. So we get four um, modalities that are just, you know, we don't have to postulate or axiomatize them. They actually part, they're just sugar now for the dependent type structure. And the claim is that just by playing now with, now we have a rich system of modalities, just playing with them actually turns out to know, particularly about quantum measurement, about quantum state preparation. So I have some slides here. Maybe I'll just jump since we're in the question session. Uh, let me just jump to, sorry, I need to shrink my window here. Let me just jump to, to this here. So for instance, remember that there was one of these, one of these modalities was necessity. This is the, this was the operation that takes a dependent, a W dependent type, takes its direct sum, and then pulls it, context ex extends it back up. So if, if this, dependent linear type was actually constant in its dependency, then, then this necessity operator is just the same thing as actually tensoring its constant value H with the linear span, which I'm writing QW of the underlying parameterized type. And now, so, so you can think of this, this necessity modality W applied to a quantum state space as being exactly, well, what in quantum computing textbooks, you'll see denoted by this, notation where people say, okay, here's a kind of, here's a Hilbert space H which runs through my circuit. And there's another system with Hilbert space QW and they're tensored. They are comp compound, uh, compiled, uh, sorry, what's the right word? We form a compound system of them. And then in quantum circuits, one wants to do things like, what if we do a measurement on these qubits, say if W were just the set of bits, this would be qubit with the notation. So what if we measure this qubit so that's so that's standard notation, standard graphic notation that you find in the standard textbooks, which is not always really formally defined, but which I'm not claiming is easily nicely defined by dependent linear type theory. So they imagine there's a measurement process and outcomes in a quantum measurement, outcomes a classical measurement result and the collapsed, as one says, quantum state. So outcomes a system where you just have a quantum state H, which is now parameterized by W instead of being tensored by QW. And this tensor product, as I just said, can be identified with this necessity modality applied, applied to H. It's a co-monadic modality, so it has a co-unit. And applying this co-unit, if you unwind it, it's just a simple exercise, does the following. It says, if we are, so everything is parameterized over W and W parameterized types. So we end up with a W parameterized type. So this co-unit actually says, if I'm in world, if I observe classically W, then, on that branch, if you will, project project onto the corresponding subspace. Remember, this was the direct sum of the W index direct sum of couples. So this is exactly the the infamous mysterious quantum measurement process, including its collapse, which for Neumann postulated in 1935 or something, looking at experimental evidence that was available then. And uh, what I'm claiming, or what we're claiming in this article of the quantum monadology is if, if you just take the pen linear type theory with a minimal set of well-behavedness considerations as are confirmed by, by Mitchell's theory, then extracting this, this quantum modal logic from it and just extracting all its meanings actually knows everything about quantum measurement. In fact, there's, for instance, um, easy proofs now um, of statements that in the literature remain informal and unproven, such, such as the all-important 
deferred measurement principle where, where people assume that if you have, uh, well, I'm, I'm running out of time, I guess, but some where some circuits of some shape, quantum circuits, are argued to be equivalent to quantum circuits of a different shape. And in this um, quantum model logic that emerges from the pendulina types, it turns out this equivalence is really just a Kleistly equivalence for the um, for this modality. So I think this is this independent of topological quantum computation to finally come back to answering the question. I think there's a lot of room to um, to use the pendulinear types further room and verification of them in quantum programming. Great. Thank you. More questions? Um, I'll ask a question. Uh, thank you for the talk. This was really interesting. Um, Hi, Jennifer, you talked a little you. bit. Hi, yeah, good to see you. Uh, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, compilation being difficult uh, in the setting of of uh, topological quantum computing, um, and so uh, how does uh, could you say a little bit more about that? Um, how does that play out in the in the setting of uh, linear linear homotopy type theory? Or uh, right, the yeah, you know, this was I this was meant to be a rather generic um, remark I made. I I use this to motivate the fact that our type theory should know about the linear aspect. So in particular, it should know about the that's why I called it compilation. So in the sense of circuit compilation, you do want to know as you I guess. Do inquire. You do want to know what is the tensor product and how does it behave of say two quantum circuits, and um, and and what does it mean to have uh, the yanking operation? Um, let me let me maybe go back to this to the slide where I showed this. So this was an argument that just said we do we to to accurately model quantum computing. I don't have to convince you of that. It's just your point, really. Um, sorry. I, we we do want we do want to know we do want to have the linear aspect we do want to know that our um, we do want to know what it means for types to be linear types that was the argument with the compilation so it's just here All right so this was meant to argue you I think there's approach uh, some people maybe I forget the names now. Of course, go and implement uh, some aspects of quantum computation just in Cork or just in plain acta and uh, just by just by modeling things. But then you, you're lacking this intrinsic um, reflection of quantum properties. For instance, the no cloning theorem. Yeah, I should maybe mention this: the no cloning and no deletion theorem um, that one certainly wants to have verified in a in a valid quantum circuit is something that can be derived in in the linear dependent type theory. It can be verified by the type theory. It can be enforced. Whereas, um, whereas if if you embed your quantum programming language in a in a classical host language, then it's it's kind of alien to the host language. The host language doesn't know that no cloning should be possible. That's what I mean. Thanks. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, well, let's all thank Urz again. Thank you for your attention. Okay, and we meet again in two weeks. Uh, the next speaker is Emile Orléans. So I hope to see you then. <laughs>